I now extend a warm welcome to Honorable Madam Vice Chancellor, Professor Anita Ghai, Professor Vibhuti Patel, Professor Vina, Professor Vina Punacha, friends and well wishers of the center, colleagues, and my dear and my dear students. The Nira Desai Memorial Lecture is an annual event which is organized by the center in honor of Dr. Nira Desai, who was the pioneer of women's studies in India, and she was also the first director of the center. Now I'll request Professor Vibhuti Patel, a well-known feminist scholar, activist, and was also the former head of the economics department, SNDT Women's University, and who had been long, who has had, had long association with Professor Neera Desai to introduce her critical legacy to our audience. I now request Vibhuti Patel to please uh, share her, share her thoughts with us. Professor Vibhuti Thank you, Professor Putul Sate, for inviting me for this very important historic event of Dr. Neera Desai Memorial Lecture Series, who was a pioneer of women's studies in India. And I greet Professor Ujwala Chakradev, Honorable Vice Chancellor of SNDT Women's University, today's Chief Case, Professor Vina Punacha, and Professor Anita Gai, who will be giving keynote address, and the esteemed participants. Uh, Neera Desai was responsible for attracting hundreds of you know, hundreds of young girls into the newly emerging discipline called women's studies. I was one of them. She nurtured two generations of women's researchers, activists, academicians in such a way that women's cause became their lifelong mission. She taught, she taught them to examine and analyze every situation through gender lens. She inculcated confidence in all of us to carve our niche in uncharted areas. She encouraged all of us to think critically and construct knowledge by dedicating ourselves to research, teaching, training, documenting, and action to transform women's studies uh, reality, women's reality. She inspired us to commit ourselves to strengthen women's studies as a discipline. To her, women's studies was not an ivory tower discipline, but had an action agenda of social transformation. She always said, we are not against men, but we are for women. We are promoting women's concerns, basically, to, to have a goal of emancipation of human liberation. Nira Desai was born in 1925 in the middle class Gujarati family that supported freedom movement. As a schoolgirl, she, along with Mandakini Kunnikal Narayan, Professor Usha Mehta, uh, who started underground radio for freedom movement called Voice of India, and this year they have, they have published her book also. Uh, she actively worked for Monkey Brigade, that was Gandhi, she called it Manar Sena. Uh, she, she took part in the Quit India movement and as a college student, and she was arrested several times during British administration for her active involvement in freedom movement. She completed her post-graduation immediately after India gained its independence, and by then she had turned socialist. Though she got PhD in sociology for her doctoral thesis, its content, her PhD thesis content touched economics, anthropology, ethnography, and historical dimensions of women in India. This interdisciplinary work was published in a book form as Women in Modern India in 1952. What she observed in the early 50s was validated by the women's rights movement in 1970 onwards. And yes, she was very much ahead of time. Nira Desai joined SNDT Women's University in the late 50s, served on several decision-making bodies of SNDT Women's University as a professor, head of the department of uh, postgraduate department of sociology, as a founder director of postgraduate studies and research, research center, and founder of Research Center for Women's Studies. Earlier it was research unit and center for rural development till she retired in 1984. She also played a very important role in shaping. She many times, like she, she was an officiating vice chancellor during 1970 and 1984, several times. For her, the most important task was teaching research and action. Research unit on women's studies in 1974 became a model and inspiration, uh, inspiration for other such centers, and the UGC considered it as a model to be emulated. She readily shared her ideas, methods, information with anybody who approached her. 
she knew that ideas travel with individuals. She traveled extensively, not only in the length and breadth of India, but uh, in several continents on this planet. In 1990, she supported efforts of establishing sound and picture archives for research center for women, uh, for, 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 on women, uh, which is called Sparrow. Uh, she was a bio. She she also was a founding member, life member of Indian Association of Women Studies, which she hosted along with the colleagues at Research Unit way back in 1981. She was one of the mainstays of India Center for Human Rights and Law in Mumbai, a pioneering human rights organization. She was a, also the founder member of Center for Women's Development Studies in Delhi, ICSSR Center on Women's Studies, which uh, which is a niche of policy intervention with regards to women's development. She was closely associated with feminist groups such as Vacha in Mumbai, Astitva in Valsad, Sahir in Vadodara. Uh, she also brought out Women's Studies Quarterly along with a group of women, including me and Sonal Shukla. It was a Gujarati feminist journal called Nari Mukti, a quarterly, and it continued continuously came out for nearly 10 years. During 1990s, she was on the advisory board of Sehat, uh, in its formative years, she had high respect for women's rights activists as she believed in experiential learning. Professor Neera Desai, as a pioneer of women's studies uh, in India and a creator of model women's studies center, combined the ethos of women's studies and women's movement at SNDT Women's University. A uh, fitting tribute to Neera Ben was a nomination, her nomination for 1,000 women for Nobel Peace Prize. And she, the same uh, uh, ethos she imparted on the young women, uh, women activists. We have to take women's studies to a newer heights in terms of its epistemological growth and also construction of new body of knowledge in gray areas of intellectual engagement for strengthening transformatory processes for better quality of life, not only for women, but also for humankind as such. Nirabin always said, there cannot be women's liberation without liberation of humankind and vice versa. Neera Ben, we will always celebrate your spirit. Uh, Neera Ben is with us uh, with, through her books. She had a large volume of books and articles. She uh, produced over 50 years of her academically and intellectually active life. And her legacy is still continuing and research center every year reminds us and acts as a conscience keeper to continue the legacy of our foremothers like Nira Desai, Vina Majumdar, Lila Dubey, and so many of our, who dedicated their whole life for building women's studies as a movement. Thank you very much once again for giving me this opportunity. Now request Professor Anita Gai to deliver the 12th Nira Desai Memorial Lecture. Professor Anita Gai, I welcome you once again. Thank you, Dr. Sathe, uh, uh, and um, I, I'm, I'm really uh, uh, privileged uh, to be part of the SNDT University. Uh, thank you to Professor Ujwila um, Chakarte, uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor, um, uh, Guest of Honor, Professor Veena Punacha, uh, Professor Vibhuti Patel, a friend as well as a colleague, okay, and all others who are around me. I think it's a, a really a, a, a treat that I have been like you know invited for uh, this particular uh, lecture, uh, and and uh, uh, it's it's, it's uh, amazing that the kind of work that she has done. I mean, you know, the learning still has to be there from you know whatever she has written i'll start with it and then of course you know i mean i hope uh, it is uh, for everyone uh, if there's any uh, uh, i i suppose i'll finish and then if there are any questions we can kind of you know pick that up uh, okay so uh, um, like i said uh, Professor Neera Desai's groundbreaking influence to growth and development of women's studies is well known. More than six de uh, decades, this extraordinary woman has touched many ecospheres. 
like uh, uh, Dr. Patel has uh, uh, indicated, as an exemplary scholar, teacher, and mentor, a researcher, an activist, an institutional builder, a freedom fighter, and a pioneer. This ostensibly diverse pathways to her effort grew up of her core commitment to gender equity, a commitment exemplified in her struggle to get women's studies into the NCDT University, as well as many other organizations, and the methodology. She gave the discipline in its formative years. To her, women's studies was a political tool of social change. I must acknowledge that the rereading has been a treat. It is through her uh, that uh, uh, I could connect once again to disability and gender, but more important, the women's and uh, you know movement in, in in one sense. To accept women's studies in those days meant walking in an uncharted path without a roadmap or signpost. Professor Desai's own journey into women's studies was a long and lonely path, which required bravery to break accepted conventions of scholarship within academia. As Veena Ji maintains that there is a seamless connection between her activism, her teaching, and writings. Unfortunately, the one opportunity in which she and I could have met did not materialize since she was not well at that time. In the absence of physical meeting, after having heard um, of her in IWS from the very beginning of my interest in women's movement, I find myself drawn to an imaginary conversation in which there is an interaction between the two of us. Um, Professor Desai, uh, and I, I begin with that. Professor Desai, I'm so very appreciative of sharing your thoughts. And the first quote that I kind of, you know, uh, uh, which she shares with me is that on one side, the old fossilized oppressive institutional and I ideological legacy, which works as a dead weight, has to be swept aside. On the other, general poverty, lack of economic uh, opportunity, illiteracy, and absence of uh, cultural amenities handicap the overwhelming section of women from enjoying even some of the rights granted under the Constitution of Free India. The court made me ask Professor Desai about the word handicap. Also, I uh, asked her whether women with disabilities who are invisibilized in both patriarchy and normative hegemony, uh, what would you think about them? Uh, Professor Desai heard me and then gently said the following. Uh, the voices that emerge from those disabled women narratives are not a chorus in unison. They are voices that agree and disagree, but their core concern is similar and genuine. There's also nothing conclusive about what is spoken in these narratives. They are open-ended narratives. There is a possibility that the right questions will in future lead us to a variety of right answers. Though belated and limited, uh, the narratives, I hope, will provide insights into diverse flavors of feminist activism. Uh, quote, unquote, uh, this is in 2006. Um, were these flavors really diverse? Professor Desai, your book opened with a statement that the position of women in any society is a significant pointer to the level of culture of that society. Would you relate disability to the cultural construction of lack, vulnerability, and deficiency? She was quiet, took time, and articulated gently and patiently. Uh, this is what I'm imagining. Okay, uh, So she says, though the theoretical and judicial basis for women's equality has been laid down, the building up of the entire structure on the foundation remains to be done. The women's movement shall have to strike out a new path, march along a different road. It will require a new vision, new methods of struggles, a new type of leadership, uh, quote, unquote, again. Her answers are contemplative. Her observations coming at different points of time push us to reflect on our politics and practice. Let me share with you whatever I have learned over the years about disability, 
uh, I won't be able to say everything about disability, but whatever is possible, I will. Uh, an initial engagement with the issue of oppression, which I think was central to Professor Desai, began as we negotiated with the socio-cultural, economic, and political positioning as a women in traditionally patriarchal society. A closer acquaintance with the developing intellectual uh, discourse on women's movement especially indicated how the movement that originated essentially as a response to oppression excluded disabled women. It was indeed a painful and disillusioning realization that disabled women occupy a multifarious and marginalized position in Indian society on their disability and also on sociocultural identities that separate categories constructed according to such properties as caste, class, and social position. Uh, disabled women thus can have plural identity markers, their daily experience, perplexing and difficult. Uh, Brian Water, a scholar who says that some losses relate directly to disability, some do not. Often disability and impairment are interwoven with identity and experience in a complex narrative which renders separation on identification of disability losses meaningless. The very real danger for dis disabled women is that this sphere of our experience of our sense of self may be rendered less admissible or possible banished entirely from view under the host of moral imperative exercised by a medicalized society to overcome, normalize, disguise, defeat, disown, defy, or otherwise avoid the perceived emotional trappings of disablement. Thus, gender and disability combine to form some of more severe forms of relegation and downgrading. The predicament of disabled women is made more complex by virtue of the fact that they are simply not regarded as women. They are encouraged to be childlike, dependent, and apologetic towards able-bodied society, which usually fails to acknowledge their existence. Historically, too, able-bodied society has failed to recognize the different experiences of disabled women. It is assumed that disabled women do not have to deal with the same oppressions that non-disabled women confront, primarily because disabled women are unseen in the heteronormative, able-bodied society. While non-disabled women uh, fight for equal rights in a patriarchal order, disabled women are rarely recognized as persons. This holds not only for uh, those whose disability is very uh, uh, severe, but also for anyone who is different from the ideal form, right from childhood, Disability imposes a subordinate status on women with disabilities and increases the likelihood of denial of rights. Uh, in the Indian context, where being a disabled girl is a fate considered worse than death, carrying the burdens of both gender and disability. While it is true that women with disabilities have not been entangled in the web of patriarchal social expectations of marriage and motherhood that women's movement has challenged, the denial of women's traditional roles to disabled women creates the terms rolelessness or social invisibility, which is given by Ash and Fine, and cancellation of femininity that forces the disabled women to pursue the female identity valorized by culture but denied to her more vigorously. With a body that does not measure up to societal norms, the situation becomes precariously unstable. In the absence of education, employment, infrastructure, and a social security system, autonomy is a formidable goal for women in India to attain, and more so for disabled women. The resolution of any issues concerning disability has to be in the context of family and community. Consequently, the much needed political action has not been forthcoming. The resistance offered by disabled women has only led to a superficial acknowledgement of differences with an implicit assumption that the core issue is gender. The perceived need, therefore, has been to raise the gender issues, presumably adequately enough to address all women's lives, regardless of their background and differences. 
At least this recognition is responsible for the emergence of discourse about of discourse about difference. In contrast, Professor Desai expressed unease that new emphasis on difference would dilute and solidarity among all classes of women. In one sense, I agree that discourse on difference has not been able to increase acceptance of disabled women concerns in social policy or in enhancing the quality of their lives. In my understanding, the absence of a disabled body is an oversight that reflects a historical practice that continues to render the disabled invisible in a manner similar to the experiences of oppression as it was evident in Black, uh, Dalit, rural women. Uh, thus, a non-disabled subject, upon encountering its other, that is the disabled subject, finds it necessary to suppress the memory of this deviant image in order to support the illusion of normalcy and wholeness. Uh, that these claims to normalcy or wholeness are themselves illusions become vividly apparent when one examines how constructions of a normative self are in fact, in fact uh, predicated on the existence of a disabled other. Another example of the unique experience of women with disability is the evaluative male gaze. If the male gaze makes the able-bodied women feel like passive objects, the stare that disabled are subjected to turns them into a grotesque sight. I'm very concerned about the stare, which becomes extremely oppressive. Disabled women contend not only how men look at women, but also how society stares at disabled people, stripping them of any semblance of resistance. Women with disabilities escaped the scrutiny from the forward uh, thinking movements. It is true that the universal sisterhood has been problematic. While discourse in India has included disabled women's voices into the narratives of marginalized women, the tokenism that is evident in both activism and research is undeniable. Though couched in politically correct language, disabled women are still an afterthought. The problem cannot be resolved so easily by merely adding on disabled people as another category to the list of matters or kinds of issues requiring attention. My objection to the theory of double disadvantage is that of that it does not empower disabled women. I always feel uncomfortable reading about our lives and concerns when they are presented in these terms. For women, the status of disabled amalgams, their status of being female to create a unique kind of oppression. Uh, it indicates that I feel burdened by the disadvantage to say that the issue for disabled women is the dilemma for identity for an individual experiencing multiple disadvantage and oppression. It seems that I feel like a victim. Such writings do not empower me. We have to find a way of making experience of women with disabilities visible, sharing them with each other and with the non-disabled people in a way uh, which, while drawing attention to the differences in our lives, does not undermine our wish to assert our self-worth. Specifically, the condition of a woman with disability is pitted with the statement, Ek to lakhi, upar se apahij one a girl and that two disabled. While the intermingling of disablement and gendering reflects reality, it offers little hope for empowerment. Cited in Professor Desai's book, the oppressed with, without a hope are mystically, mysteriously quiet. When the conception of change are beyond the limits of the possible, there are no words to articulate discontent, so it's sometimes held next to exist. This mistaken belief arises because we can only grasp silence in the moment in which it is breaking. The sound of silence breaking makes us understand what we could not hear before. But the fact that we could not hear does not prove that no pain existed. Writing a subject of a disabled woman into the ongoing discourse necessitates a certain exercise of power to construct that subject in some form to give her shape and to breathe life into her. This cannot be accomplished without knowing how she might construct herself. Here I go to 1994, in which Professor Desai, I think, was very much alive. And, you know, uh, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm 
not mistaken, I think in the uh, uh, women's quarterly, uh, uh, this was written about, in which there was a nationwide protest from Indian women groups when 14 mentally challenged girls were compelled to undergo hysterectomies in the Sassoon General Hospital in Pune. The incident was reported in the major newspapers on February 24th. The case involved development uh, disabled girls who were under institutional care. The girls were not allowed to wear pajamas with drawstrings as well as sanitary napkins with belts, as it was claimed that they might use the strings to commit suicide. The records regarding the stay had not been kept very carefully, so it was difficult to prove that they were attempted suicides. To deal with the problem of menstrual hygiene, the hospital decided to go ahead with hysterectomies. Not with it standing, Notwithstanding this paternalistic deprivation of women's necessities, boys in the same institution were issued pyjamas, complete with drawstrings, without any fear of suicide. Sadly, this incident does not lead up to a broader dialogue about the enforced sterilization of developmentally disabled women, both within the institution and those living within families in their homes. This failure indicated that Indian feminists did not see women with disabilities as an important and enduring constituency. Though uh, later there were efforts, and I'm quoting Hindu, uh, uh, 2005, which sought to ban forced hysterectomy of women with disability. The mothers of women with disabilities who live with their families want their daughters to get hysterectomies, but they are apprehensive that that abuse or rape might result in pregnancy. This indicates that even within the family, legitimate abuse is accepted, but pregnancy is allowed at all costs. However, feminists have failed to take cognizance of this issue. Such experience of disability continue to be confounded with the identity of being a woman such that its specific character does not receive its due and is lost in concern for women's rights more generally. Assertions are made about layers of oppression, but disabled women continue to be invisibilized. This oversight can be condoned in the name of prioritization. To the disabled women, this oversight is not very different from patriarchy inherent in disability studies itself and activism, where men determine the agenda and the priorities. I move on to uh, you know prenatal selection, because Professor Desai, I think, was very, very actively you know involved with the amniocentesis uh you know test which came up and of course feminists knew very soon that it was you know it would become a sex selection test and not really a test which would kind of tell about the um uh disabilities that are evident in a society where there is a widespread female abortion Aborting imperfect children will not cause any stir or agitation. While there is an ongoing discussion of the ethical contradictions that prenatal test sex testing poses for feminists, prenatal testing to identify and abort children at risk for disabilities does not get addressed. Disabled people have been highly critical of prenatal screening and selective abortion, seeing them as a new strategy of eugenics. New reproductive technologies reinforce the notion that the humanity must aspire for an ideal body. Such a position reinforces disability as deficient. However, this approach is like a slippery slope to other forms of selection and thus eventually to a world of new designer baby eugenics. However, the idea of homogenization that designer baby eugenics propagates is to be resisted. The bill that emerged in 2020 creates more problems than solutions, as they really do not talk about selection. And they only talk about you know, the number of weeks and, and other details. Uh, it's all the more remarkable, uh, therefore, that an unspoken consensus seemed to have formed around a description of women's studies as neither a discipline nor a specific topic, but a perspective that requires articulation in every discipline, institution, in all studies and at all levels. Uh, Professor Desai's quote, and uh, I'm, I'm now unquoting, no matter, and, and, and this is what I'm saying, 
No matter how attentive the scholar is to the axes that constitute social identity, some of the axes will be ignored and some selected. An inescapable factor of human embodiment, as uh, uh, Nietzsche uh, pointed out, is that an eye turned in no particular direction in which the active and interpreting forces through which alone seeing becomes seeing something are supposed to be lacking. These always demand of the eye an absurdity and a nonsense. There is always a perspectively, perspe perspectively seeing and a perspective uh, knowing. Uh, it, perspective knowing is never really pure. It's always influenced by our political, social, and personal interests. Even in acting on the desire of embrace, uh, to, to embrace our differences, we are unavoidably centric. Mere recognition of differences does not assure that we will construct an adequate representation of difference. Further, constant attention to difference might create and construct others. The concrete experiences of exclusion have neither to be grounded in theory nor given a theoretical response. Rather, as new narratives begin to emerge, the major task is to tell the story of diverse women's experiences uh, in a, as truthful a manner as possible. The only requirement is to listen, to become aware of one's own biases, prejudices, and ignorance, so that a process of stretching the borders of what Pratt calls the narrow circle of self can begin. I would not forgive myself if I do not talk about the care recipients as unpaid care is very familiar with this audience. Uh, disability studies contends that the feminization of care in a philocentric culture makes participants in a caring relationship, regardless of gender identity, necessarily subordinate. I recall Julia Twigg's work on older people's experiences of being given a bath. What she says is eliminating. One person, strong and able, stands above and over another who's frail and physically vulnerable, forced to rely on their strength and goodwill. Being naked in the face of someone who's not contains a powerful dynamic of domination and vulnerability. And it is often used in situations of interrogation and torture as a means of subjugating the individual, quote, unquote. Even if dependency is recognized as an essential part of the human condition, this should not obscure the fact that some people's experiences of body uh, places them at a greater risk of losing their dignity and rights. Someone who, for example, does not use speech to communicate has a higher level of cognitive impairment and or relies on others for help with all their daily functions, while it may help to recognize the way as social beings, individuals, dependent on one another, limitations are qualitatively different. However, in contrast to cure, care for me means interdependence, making differences less problematic, even though functional capacity may change over time. Learning from Professor Desai's work, I struggle to extend boundaries of knowledge production of disability studies. Consequently, my own research and practice has led to evolve and legitimize disability studies as an area of inquiry. Before I underscore the potential of disability studies, let me foreground some of the challenges that, uh, that I believe have led to a development of disability studies. As a disabled woman, my own location in the field is complicated because it raises perturbing yet important questions. What is my stance as an activist? With what authority can I speak with disability and disability studies, and why? Am I speaking with disabled people or about them? Which language do I use to describe disability? Who has the power to name and label? How does the understanding of disability studies exclude others from speaking out? Similarly, how does one negotiate with uh, issues of diagnosis and certification? My own understanding is that Disability is not really a fixed category, more clearly signified by the white cane user or a crutch user or a wheelchair uh, user. Disability, like most dimensions of experience, is polysemic. This is indeterminate and unstable in meaning, as well as a mixture of culture and fiction that depends on who says 
what to whom, when and where, uh, a quote by Corker, unquote. Uh, the emphasis is mine. Uh, there is no fixity in disable, uh, disability categories. Many women with disabilities have complained that far too long, ableism has left us on the margins of society. However, my understanding is that disability study places the responsibility for re-examining and repositioning the place of disability within society, not on individual, but on, on academia, as well as women's movement itself. The purpose of making disability studies an academic discipline is to create a body of knowledge which can provide challenges towards rethinking and reflecting upon aspects of our comprehension of disability and social sidelining. Disability studies exist, exists at the uneven boundaries of the social, concurrently rebellious and celebratory in its exist, insistence that disability is neither tragedy nor inspiration, but a satisfying and enjoyable way of being in the world. Just like the unforeseen possibilities of a new day, reflecting on the field of disability studies is also loaded with the unknown. For instance, knowledge of disability has to be engaged in the unlearning of traditional thinking privilege so that not only is one marginalized constituency in a position to listen to another, but also one learns to speak in such a way that disability studies academia can rewrite the relationship between the margin and the center. There are no easy answers to these never ending questions of identity and interconnections. There is no easy way of drawing boundaries between who should be in and who should be out. No easy inventory of heterogeneity of innumerable disability communities. I believe that disability studies make these questions relevant to everyone, whether they identify as disabled or not at any given time. It seems to me that identity is not an ideal insertion into the political discourse. Rather, it is a critical implication for how the discipline of disability studies can expand and thrive within academia. As an insider, I find that the ideas are wide ranging with the most radical reimagining of the possibilities. They produce few answers, but rather embrace the practice of constantly troubling the questions. They make even the radical seem quite conservative. For instance, they take any theory humanism, psychology, Marxism, critical race theory, feminist theory, LGBT, queer theory, etc. You bring disability studies in the myths and pose questions such as, uh, what are the conceptions of the normal? What is autonomy? When exactly is life not worth living? Why does rationality have to be the sole determinant of our humanity? How do we define limit? How is post-humanism critical to disabled people? Is there any process in which the Supreme Court of India legalized passive euthanasia, 9th March 2018, uh, uh, passive euthanasia by means of the withdrawal of life support to patients in a permanent vegetative state? I go to Professor Desai to conclude that we need to ask these questions as to whether we are losing the transformative edge of women's studies, or I would say even the disability studies. Whether silence or negotiation is the strategy of women, does it lead to any improvement in handling the situation on the ground? I mean, I can't imagine. This is what she says in 2006. And you look at the, uh, you know, uh, how, uh, how exemplary she was. Explorations in new areas the search for deeper meanings, encompassing difference, and avoidance of simplistic explanations of the problem are important. But at the time, there is a danger of getting lost in meandering articulations and expressions. For instance, while recognizing the significance of individual resistance to violence and the vital necessity of building confidence, inner strength, and courage without the collective struggle, there is hardly any solution to individual tragedy. Uh, quote, unquote, uh, Professor Desai, 2002. Uh, thank you.
thank you professor gai that was a intellectual treat in fact i you i went back to the indian association of women studies the goa conference where i had first heard you and i was mesmerized then and now also i'm similarly mesmerized you have raised so many important issues that i don't think i should i should even attempt to basically sum them up but there's something which has left me thinking particularly the manner in which women studies and uh, 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 this disability studies can actually open up a new transformative age and i think the very salient feature of your lecture was the weaving of neera desai's voice with yours i think that was something remarkable i'm sure all of us will remember that for years to come so thank you professor gai thank you very much